thank you for inviting me and um, apologies for, uh, uh, although Vili has already done it, for having to address you in this global language of English. Um, I, I wish I could speak your language, but unfortunately I can't. Um, and because this event is, um, is funded by FEPS uh, and my research uh, is also, uh, my current research project is also funded by FEPS, I'm, I'm going to focus very much on presenting that particular piece of research, which I'm hoping over the next year will, will spread to include Finland. Um, we, but we have to first look at the context. And some of this may look a little bit familiar, but I think it's very important to emphasize that uh, in the last few years, basically starting around 2013, about enough time after the financial crisis for the corporate world to start restructuring itself in quite a major way. We've seen this proliferation of new language coming on the scene, talking of which uh, the platform labor is only one. And um, there's, and there's an enormous diversity of terms. They're not all talking about the same thing, but they're talking about overlapping things. And they come from very many different sources. You've got a sort of Californian, hippie utopian idea of, of a new sharing economy where you know we all trust each other so much we probably can evolve into something that doesn't even need money anymore. And then you've got a kind of dystopian view that this is an extreme form of global sourcing where you know employers can scour the world for the cheapest possible source of labor to exploit. And then uh, which comes from a lot, some of the language that Durant uses the word sourcing tends to come from this perspective, cloud sourcing, crowdsourcing, etc., etc. So we have this um, enormous diversity of language which creates a kind of miasma. And it's not the first time this happened. I'm long enough to have seen being around this loop before, you know, after the financial crisis uh, in, in, in the 70s, you know, the, the people started talking about uh, teleworking, telecommuting, networking, etc., etc. In, in the 90s, people talked about uh, the information economy, the the uh, information society, the weightless economy, the connect, et cetera, et cetera. So whenever, basically, whenever the, the kind of corporate world changes and the world of labor changes and things no longer fit the existing categories, this a plethora of new terms comes up um, from different directions, from industry, from academics, from, you know, lots of people coin these terms. I myself have been guilty of some of this in the past. And, and we, um, you know, people try to find a way to conceptualize these changes. And, but it's, it's a confusing world because everything's moving and developing very, very quickly. Um, sorry, I've left out a few at the bottom there. Um, meanwhile, we have this new corporate landscape, these new, firms popping up, some of which are familiar, as, as, as Willie was saying, some of which are very familiar to the general public, some of which are quite unknown to the general public. And so the feeling starts spreading that something's going on here, something is changing, how can we understand it? And um, this, I have to say, none of this has come from nowhere. There's a historical context um, and you can see that the new trends that we're talking about, that we still haven't got really a proper name for, as the evolution of a number of pre-existing trends that have been going on sometimes for 20 or 30 years that reached critical mass in this uh, second decade of the 21st century. The first is just the use of online platforms for managing work, online means for managing work. Now that's new. Since the late 70s, large companies have been managing their global supply chains and their logistics networks and so on using online means. But this is spread, as computerization has spread, this is spread to more and more companies. Secondly, the development of what you might call a global reserve army of workers with digital skills and speaking global languages, which probably 
became very important in the 90s, especially in that period when everybody was terrified about the millennium bug, you know, <laughs> all, all this software work was sent to India and so on. And, and, and partly actively driven by policies uh, from the World Bank and uh, the European Commission and so on to, to you know, to, to train the world in digital skills, which has been seen as a, as a good thing. Um, a standardized, an increasing standardization of tasks, which underpins any kind of global expansion. You know, the, uh, uh, it was, it was the, the standard shipping container that underlay the, the, the possibility for the huge growth in global trade that took place since the 1960s. And, and so increasingly, the work standards have developed for lots and lots of different things, including skills and standard certification of skills. And of course, the more tasks are standard, the more they can be substituted for each other and the more it's possible to bring in different workers to do them. And um, another thing which has happened more recently, but it very much affects the kind of local gig workers that Willie really was talking about, is the erosion of the traditional methods for self-employed people to find work. You know, in the past, if you were a window cleaner, if you were a graphic designer, uh, you know, whatever it was, people found work that in the local, they put ads in the local phone book, or they put leaflets through people's let letterboxes, or they put an ad up in the corner shop window or whatever. And suddenly, none of those methods work anymore because everybody goes to the search engine. And so suddenly, there's a possibility to, to intervene in the local source uh, search for work using the power of the tag. You know, if you, if you put in every postcode there is and every kind of occupation there is, uh, so somebody looking for a plumber in a particular postcode is, on the off search engine is, is going to find a standard platform. They're not going to find the local plumber that they would have found 20 years ago in the yellow pages. So, um, so putting these things together, with a further evolution of the, the, sorry, the global outsourcing of digital work. Um, the, I talked about this trend that um, in the 90s of offshore outsourcing. Well, offshore outsourcing of software work or call center work or whatever it was in the 90s was only possible for big companies because the transactions costs were very high. It, it takes a big risk, you know, to find the, the firm in Bangalore that can supply you with software or something. In around 2004, 2005, most of them started, it, uh, the business model developed of creating an intermediary that got rid of that risk. That's when companies like Odesk and Elance started, which are the forerunners of Upwork. And so suddenly, that possibility to access a global source of labor became available to individuals and to small companies that was previously only available to very big companies. And, um, and we also got um, this, uh, what I call the formalization of the informal economy. It's not new to employ a cleaner or a, or a taxi driver or a, or, a, or a delivery worker or a gardener or a babysitter or whatever. What, what, what's new is that it's now uh, possible for these workers to be employed via a platform, which absolutely transforms their conditions of work. It means they have to work in a standard way, uh, on, uh, on, that um, the prices for the work they do are not fixed by themselves, that they don't have a direct relationship with the client. So there's a big qualitative transformation. Uh, but there's also, of course, it makes this form of work available to a much wider range of customers. So um, all these trends have come together um, to, to contribute to the development of this new landscape of work. Uh, the policy context, I'm talking about this because this is the, the context in which my work was commissioned. Around 20, I was running uh, a, a international research network, a cost section, which, which Vili was also involved with, from 2012 to 2016, where we had people from 31 countries discussing these developments. And it became apparent around halfway through that action, around 2013, suddenly there was a policy interest in Brussels at the European level in this new development. 
um, uh, but it was initially triggered by the discussions about the digital single market. The first time I was asked to speak at the European Parliament about uh, digital platforms, they, nobody was interested in labour. They were worried about consumer rights. They were worried about consumer protection in this context. And it was really quite difficult to persuade people that there were implications for labour at all. Um, but this uh, change happened very, very rapidly once it started. Um, there, there was also an interest from another development <laughs> about social innovation. There was an idea that platforms were a new form of social innovation, and indeed some of them were. And um, so uh, it was, but it was seen in a very, very positive light as, as a way of, of creating new kinds of social enterprise, new kinds of employment, etc., uh, with, with the potential for job creation. And I think we also have to see it in a, in a more hard-headed way as an aspect of corporate restructuring in the aftermath of the financial crisis. But there were and have been growing since maybe 2014, concerns from trade unions, from consumer groups and government bodies about occupational safety and health, which is a huge issue, including the psychosocial risks of work in, in, for these platforms, about consumer safety, about employment status, about workers' rights, about insurance, uh, about tax. You know, there are whole lots of very practical policy issues that people have suddenly started thinking, oh, you know, what do we do about this? What do we, you know, if there's a fatal accident involving an Uber driver, you know, it's an issue of worker safety, it's an issue of consumer safety, it's also an uh, issue of public safety. Who should be responsible for, you know, <laughs> for <laughs> inspections, for, you know, that lots and lots of questions, are, are practical questions are raised. And of course, the huge, as, as Lily was saying, impl implications for social benefit systems. Social benefit systems are mostly based on the idea either you're employed or you're not employed. If you're, uh, it, uh, and here we have a whole growing army of workers who don't know from one hour to the next if and when they will next be employed. How does the social benefit system cope with these workers? How should they be classified? Should they be forced to look for regular work? Should this be considered a form of work that they must be pushed into accepting? Um, you know, uh, should, they, should they be deprived of benefits on the grounds that they're not genuinely seeking what you know there are all sorts of real practical problems are generated here and also of course the big questions about what is the sustainability of these new work how can you build a, a, a career over a lifetime um, how can you uh, build a, a, a you know, a, a career that allows for different family stages, you know, <laughs> and all the rest of it. So lots and lots of very big questions. That, so in other words, there was a need for systematic research. And this is where um, I was commissioned in at the end of 2015 to do some research on this. And of course, you have to start by saying, you know, how big is the phenomenon? You can't start actually looking seriously at the policy implications of something if you've got absolutely no idea how many people it affects, how many people are doing it, and what their characteristics are. So that um, put us in the situation of having to try and come up with a definition. Now, this is, that is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Uh, these, all these different platforms have, uh, firstly, you can't, it's, very difficult to decide actually what is a platform and what isn't a platform. There are all sorts of overlaps and fuzzy boundaries between other kind, not only other kinds of websites through which people might sometimes find work, but also the traditional service companies that might use some of the same techniques to manage their workers, like traditional cleaning companies, traditional taxi firms, etc., that are changing their business model. So you've got these big fuzzy areas of overlap. You've also got um, very dynamic and rapidly changing um, business models. I mean, uh, we one of the people we interviewed who was an Uber driver in our research, we counted that there had been over 60 different changes to his terms and conditions of employment in a period of less than two years for which he'd worked for Uber. And we now see Uber is the classic example, in a way, of a change of business model because they they started off in the period when 
credit was scarce with this very clever idea, I like Airbnb, instead of investing in depreciating assets, you persuade other people to buy the car or buy the house or whatever it is, and then take a rent for using it. And so that works as a business model for a while, but then competitors come in, it becomes less advantageous, uh, policymakers start responding, the landscape changes. So what are Uber now doing in the United States? They're investing in self-driving cars, which is a completely different business model. <laughs> Replacing goods for services, investing heavily in new technologies. So, you know, these companies don't stand still. We can't just come up with a definition and say that's what a platform looks like. Um, so, our functional typology, we, we had to come up with something, is we, but recognizing that there is a lot of fuzziness, we said, let's find out how many people fit into these categories. Firstly, the people who are doing online work with online management, the people that, that Vili was talking about, who are basically working digitally. It's work that can be done anywhere in the world managed via an online platform, which might be high skill or might be low skill. Um, and secondly, work which is managed online but carried out offline, carried out locally, um, either uh, in public spaces like driving or delivery work, or carried out in other people's homes or on business premises, a much more concealed kind of work, if you like. You know. Everybody sees the delivery riders on the street. Not many people see the, the cleaners going, you know, from house to house to do their cleaning work. So th that was our starting point. And we designed what started off as being an experimental survey in the UK, but has now spread. We've now done the survey in seven countries, and we're, this year we're doing another eight countries. Um, but it was piloted in the UK. The questionnaire developed at the University of Hampshire. I don't want to go into, this is probably quite, <laughs> quite boring, this technical detail. It was funded by FEPS jointly with UNI, with the trade union. So we had trade union partners and think tank partners in the various countries where we did the research. Um, it was a, a complete general sample of the whole population. Um, and we interviewed approximately 2,000 people per country, working age adults. And the results are obviously, uh, you know, weighted to reflect the total population. And because some people, a lot of people didn't believe our results. When we first did the survey, people said, they can't be that many people doing it. They just can't. It must be because you're doing an online survey. So in order to check for that, we did, in the UK, we did face, we did use the same methodology, but with face-to-face -face interviews. And in Switzerland, we did the same technology, but using telephone interviews. And um, uh, the result of that uh, validated, basically, the results of the online survey. So, um, so there we are. And, and the, the, all this um, quantitative research, like all quantitative research, it throws up many more questions than it answers. And we're addressing those in-depth questions by doing a lot of qualitative in-depth interviews with workers as well to, to get the story behind the statistics. So what are the results? First of all, you have to put participation in the, put this in the general context of participation in the online uh, economy. Basically, people are using the internet to generate an income in lots and lots of different ways. They're also using the internet to find work in lots and lots of different ways. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so it's one of the another difficult distinction we had to make is being between people who say they're finding work online, but they're basically it's just an online version of an employment agency. We have to separate that out from the people who are working for online platforms. But anyway, here to put it in context, you can see that there are an awful lot more people selling stuff on eBay than there are um, <laughs> working for online platforms. Uh, but nevertheless, there are a lot of people working for online platforms. There are also a lot of people renting out rooms through platforms like Airbnb. But you can see its significance. It um, between um, uh, 11 and 12 percent in in most uh, north in the northwest European countries, with higher uh, with a higher level in Austria and in. Um, 
uh, we'll come to that later, Italy also has a very high occasional uh, crowd work. Um, so you, you can say that uh, quite robustly that probably around 12% of the adults in Europe are doing some kind of work for online platforms. But a, only a very small portion, portion of these people are actually learning a living from it. Most of them, it's a very small proportion of their income. Um, uh, and, and they're doing it quite occasionally. The people doing it at least weekly is around three or four percent. Of, of, that's three and four percent of the total population. So that's, it's smaller, but it's not insignificant at all. That's still a lot of people. And then you can see that a lot, and there are an awful lot of people who've just registered on platforms looking for work and haven't got any as well. So there's a spectrum from people who think, I'll give it a try, and it hasn't, you know, they've put their details up on Upwork and nobody wants to employ them as a graphic designer, so they've given up on it, you know. There's a spectrum from that to people at the other extreme for whom it's their main source of income. Um, if we look here at the proportion of income, we see that for the vast majority, it's less than 10%. Um, but there is a small minority who say all, and a larger proportion for whom it's more than half. So in um, most of our um, more detailed analysis of these results, what we've done is we've looked at the people who say they get more than half their income from it who we could say are dependent on platform work as a source of income. By gender, it's surprisingly balanced, well, balanced, if I'm not sure that's the word, but in, in most countries, it's slightly more men than women. In the UK, it's more women than men. Um, it's, uh, the, and by age, it's not, it's often believed to be a phenomenon of the young. People think millennials and below. Uh, work in the platform economy, and I think lots of students do it. In fact, that quite a lot of older people are doing it. And uh, if you look, take, pick students out, students are no more likely to be doing it than anybody else. So it's it's not uh, very definitely not just a phenomenon of students. It's it's people who actually really do uh, want to earn a living. Um, now I'm I'm jumping quite quickly because I really. I uh, want to talk more about the more qualitative things. But one of the very striking uh, results of this survey is that crowd working is, I use that term because it's the, the term the Euro Fund use in Dublin, and it's kind of less loaded ideologically than a term like gig economy or something like that. But it's, it's, it's not a, an ideal term, I have to say. But basically, that they, it's an extreme form of things that are going on right across the workforce. Um, it's the tip of an iceberg, if you like. Uh, as I said earlier, that these are trends that have been going on um, for a long time. If you look, uh, most obviously, sending or receiving email from home, which we used to call teleworking, sort of teleworking. Um, yes, we, people who crowd work at least once a week are more likely to do it. Uh, it goes up to 95% of them are doing it. But people who say they are not crowd workers, it's over 50% in the Netherlands and Sweden, and, um, and a lot, <laughs> you know, a very high proportion of the general population are basically working, uh, uh, you know, extending their working day into the home, uh, uh, checking emails. Um, if you go to something that's more specialized and more particularly associated with the platform economy, uh, that, which is using an app to specify um, when work is available, which you're absolutely reliant on, you know, if you're an Uber driver, the app is what tells you when there's work available. Yes, you know, uh, crowd workers are much more likely to do it, and three quarters of them, approximately, uh, um, use such apps. But uh, an awful lot of non-crowd workers also are using these apps. Uh, up to 11% in Sweden, 9% in the Netherlands. And uh, because, of course, there are more non-crowd workers than there are crowd workers, what that means is for every crowd worker with an app on their phone telling them when they come to work, there are two or three non-crowd workers who are also relying on an app. 
So this is not a phenomenon which is, which is restricted to the platform economy. It's a, it's a much more pervasive general trend. Um, this is using an app to log the work that you've done, where you have to you know, record the hours that you've worked. Here again, um, yes, it's more common among crowd workers, but there are an awful lot of non, up, going up to nearly 20% in Sweden of non-crowd workers are being effectively managed by these tools, these app-based tools. So these are actually much more general trends. And I think when we're thinking about policies, there are quite big implications to be drawn from these findings. In the next round of surveys, which I'm happy to say will include Finland, we're going to add some extra questions about uh, user ratings, because this also seems to be a very widespread trend that affects crowd workers, but also affects non-crowd workers, which I think we, we policymakers need to keep an eye on because it has quite big implications for deprofessionalization of work and, and various other things too. Um, so we've also done some qualitative research. Again, I'm going to, I, I, there's an awful lot of very rich material which is in our report where my very talented research assistant manages to get incredibly deep uh, interview data from the people. Um, you know, she's been doing done three hour interviews at two in the morning with, <laughs> with people who break down in tears on the phone talking about their working conditions. There's a lot of very strong material there, but I'm just going to summarize it here. First of all, the impact of customer ratings is really major. People feel very, very strongly that it's unfair, that, that they have no right to challenge it, that the platforms always put the work of the, the customer first. And they say, oh, well, I got dropped from the app because I got a bad rating. And I wasn't able to say, well, actually, you know, that client was vomited all over the back of my car and you know, abused me. And you know, um, they, 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 there's just, um, there's, a, there's a terribly strong feeling that customer ratings are, are deeply deeply unfair and, and, and also deprofessionalizing, that people get bad ratings for um, things that are completely beyond their control, um, like bad traffic conditions or something like that. Um, uh, but, but also, of course, there's a lot of other evidence, not from my research, but from other research, that customer ratings are very much influenced by for instance, homophobia and racism, that people give women different ratings than they give men, that they're actually not fair and objective in the first place. And cumulatively, that can have a very disadvantageous um, impact. So uh, another thing that comes out again and again, both for online workers and offline workers, is the long and unpredictable working hours. Um, although, um, and, and, and just exhaustion, people talk about terrible exhaustion. Even people working from their homes, uh, who in principle feel that they have a lot of flexibility to sort of manage their working hours because they're working from home. In practice, if an urgent job comes in on a Friday night that has to be delivered on Monday morning, then that's your weekend gone. Um, and um, so this, uh, the long and exhausting hours um, applies right across all the different categories of crowd work that we've looked at. Of course, the implications for public safety are different. I mean, if you're operating, uh, you know, if you're a driver or a roofer or something like that, the, you know, the, um, this doesn't just have an impact on your own safety. It has an impact on public safety and the safety of the people in in the house that you're working in as well. But um, it, it, that's clearly a huge issue. Uh, the lack of pay for time spent waiting for work or seeking work is, is a big issue. Some people report, you know, for every job they get, they spend three hours putting in bids for jobs that they're not going to get, um, waiting with the app turned on for, for, for work that never comes. Um, and this is particularly problematic. I know you don't have a national minimum wage in Finland, but in countries where they do, where people are trying to find out how the national minimum wage should apply to crowd workers, it's very difficult to calculate how you factor in waiting time. Um, the inability to challenge decisions by platforms is another thing that workers feel very, very strongly about. 
uh, especially arbitrary suspensions. People who, you know, they pitch up expecting to work and they turn on the up and they find they've been dropped from the platform. Uh, it could be because of a technical mistake. It could be because their user rating has fallen below 4.7 average. It could be uh, one of a number of reasons. And often, once, once they're deactivated, they have no way to communicate with the platform, to challenge it. Uh, because most communication is via the app. And especially platforms like uh, cleaning uh, companies, for instance, they are so frightened because a lot of workers try to use the platform as a way to find a few good customers and then to work with them directly and not via the app. And the platforms are very, very aware of this. So they go to enormous lengths to make it difficult to communicate in any other way except via the app. Um, but that also means that the workers can't communicate with the platform. You know, if they, if they haven't got paid for something they feel they should have been paid for, if they've been dropped, whatever it is, there, um, there, there are huge problems with that. There is a general, even though this is not always uh, expressed as I want a trade union, there is a very uh, commonly expressed feeling of a lack of voice of being dictated to by the platform and not being able to talk back, of not being able to negotiate, not being able to discuss changes in conditions, just a general feeling that communication is a one-way flow and that they've been silenced. So um, I think this is, uh, this is an important issue for trade unions as well. Um, poor communication with employers, frequent changes of terms and conditions, and a lot of physical risks. Not just physical risks, but um, physical risks are. We're talking about when we're talking about these local services. We're talking about really dangerous jobs, you know, roofers, tree surgeons, you know, uh, occupations with a very high casualty rate, and um, but also uh, other kinds of dangers. We, we interviewed one woman who was sent to a job, a task. At 2 a.m., she had to cross London on a bus, you know, to go and work in a, a strange area. She knocked on a door and she discovered it was a gang who wanted to deliver a package of drugs for them. That was what the task was. And the, um, you know, the platform said, oh, well, it's your responsibility. You know, you should have said no. <laughs> you know, people are put in these very difficult situations. And of course, you know, as, as vulnerable workers with low self-esteem so often do, uh, this particular one, she blamed herself. She said, oh, it was my own silly fault. You know, I should have seen that they, those people were trouble. I just needed the money so badly. I wasn't thinking, you know. Um, but what kind of a society is it where these kinds of responsibilities are internalised by workers? I, I think, you know, this becomes quite an important policy issue when you multiply that by the very large numbers of, of vulnerable workers who are um, in these kinds of jobs. Lack of appropriate tools, equipment, training. Psychosocial risks are enormous. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a big literature on the relationship between precariousness and stress. But it's clear that a lot of these workers are suffering from very acute stress. And they, they talk about the impact. So I've just got a couple of quotes here. This is one uh, a driver who just says, every single day when I go to bed, I pray to my God that tomorrow the cu a customer is not going to complain <laughs> because his fear of being dropped from the platform was so great. Because a, a lot of these uh, drivers in particular, uh, you have to remember that they've had to invest in order to get the job. They have to buy the cars. A lot of them have got very big loans. They've been, they're encouraged to take out, a, to buy a better car so they can be, go into the executive category or the X category or whatever it is, different platforms have a different name for it. So they've got an enormous debt to service. And then if they have two or three weeks with no income, that's put them in a, in a really, really difficult situation. Um, this is another, um, I mean, this is not so dramatic. Although this interview, we do have some very dramatic quotes from this interviewer, but, but I think she, she puts a finger on it, which is the fact that you're so governed by metrics. Because this encapsulates uh, what the issue is, which is not just an issue for platform workers, but is increasingly 
an issue for other works, including, I may say, I don't know what, how it feels fixed at Oxford, really, but in, including university lecturers, increasingly governed by metrics, um, with performance targets to meet <laughs> X number of publications in X star journals, with uh, bringing in so much research funding, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the same applies right across the public sector and in many, many other industries. So, um, so that, that's just a taste of our qualitative uh, findings. So summary. First, we must remember that crowd workers are typically combining this form of work with many other means of income generation. In fact, um, if, uh, it, when we're asked to kind of ca ca uh, characterize who these crowd workers are, they're basically people who are patching together an income. They're not this idea of the gig, like the specialist musician who goes from gig to gig, which, which is conjured up by the phrase, the gig economy. They are much more um, people who are just desperate for an income, who are piecing together multiple sources of income from whatever source they, um, they can. One of the big failures of our survey was we asked a lot of people what their occupation was, and what kind of crowd work we're doing, in the hope that we could find, well, here are the drivers, you know, here are the online workers who, who are high skilled, here are the click workers, here are the cleaning workers, etc. We thought we'd find a nice, neat um, typology, and then we could look at the characteristics of each one. What we actually found was that everybody ticked multiple boxes. When we gave people eight broad categories of work to say, which of these do you do? The average uh, ticked six of them. 6.2, I think it was. Uh, so, uh, so instead of finding this neat landscape, like you get in the census data, you know, here, here, here are the cleaners, here are the, here are the drivers, here are the uh, uh, office workers, etc. What we found was all these people who say that they can do a bit of everything, and that, that, I mean, that, of course, raises questions about how qualified they are to do all these things, um, whether their insurance policies cover them to do all these things. It raises those kind of practical questions, but it also talks about a much more fundamental deprofessionalization of society, a kind of breakdown of clear occupational standards which has happened before in recessions. You think of those photographs from the, from the hungry 1930s in New York, you know, of people wearing a big placard, you know, saying, I speak five languages, I can do this, I can do that, give me a job, give me a job. You know? And they're, they're kind of like that, these crowd workers. It, so it's a very, very different kind of a profile from what you, you might be led to believe by some of the literature. Second, we found that definitions are, 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 are of crowd work are extremely fuzzy. There are many overlaps with other kinds of temporary work, other kinds of agency work, other kinds of casual work. There, and there, but there are mixes between online and offline work that make it uh, really um, not very useful to try to single them out as a special kind of worker who needs a special kind of status or protection. Um, uh, so the, the new working poor, who you could call them, they combine new and old forms of work and other forms of income. The other thing that we found was that the more likely you are to do crowd work, the more likely you also are to indulge in other, other forms of online income generation. So you're more likely to be selling stuff on, on um, Etsy or, or eBay or something like that, as well as being a crowd worker. Um, so, but they still, because of this shifting kind of occupational identity that moves from job to job and from sector to sector, they fall outside the scope of many of the existing uh, category, the protections that exist for particular categories of worker. But meanwhile, the practices of the gig economy are spreading to other sectors of the market, of the labor market. The expectation to be available 24 seven, the use of customer ratings, the expectation to meet quantitative performance tar targets, the monitoring and tracking of workers using GPS, which that, you know, that doesn't, it's not just Uber drivers who are tracked by GPS. I mean, the, the tracking by GPS is so sophisticated that 
I just published in the journal I edit, we just published an article from a guy in Australia who, where in, in Australia, the Uber drivers, the, the platform knows when they slam the brakes on too hard because they can calculate, you know, from the GPS. So they start getting warning. Every time you slam on the brakes and you start getting warnings that you're going to be dropped if you do that three times. Um, so the, the level of tracking is very precise. But of course, that happens to a lot of other workers too. Uh, people like care workers, uh, other kinds of drivers, almost any workers who are away from the direct sight of the managers are now liable to be, to be tracked. Um, the use of apps for communication with employers and clients, summons to work, logging working hours. So increasingly, a lack of direct communication with managers. Uh, so it, in most um, companies now, there is, a, there is an online, an impersonal online means, for instance, for claiming expenses, for booking your holiday, for... Um, uh, arranging uh, for a, a new job to be created and who's going to be on the recruitment panel, for submitting an article to a journal, for refereeing the journal. All of this stuff is mediated through online platforms without much human intervention. So there's a kind of um, management by algorithm which is now increasingly pervasive. Um, uh, and of course, this is accompanied by a, a sharp deterioration in working conditions. Longer working hours, um, more, uh, less uh, rigorous health and safety coverage, and a whole range of new psychosocial risks. And just, just to emphasize, for every crowd worker using an app, there are two or three non-crowd workers doing it. So, um, so, so what are the implications of this? I think we need to actually rethink, we need a new regulatory model of work that takes account of these things. We do, I, I, it, I, it seems to me that it would be an absolute recipe for disaster to say, here are these special workers called platform workers who need special coverage. And there are a lot of people promoting that. Uh, saying we need a new kind of employment status, or we need a U new European directive, or um, but but the reality is that the 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 situation is changing so dynamically, the business models change, and we also know that um, if you put in uh, if you create definitions that are a little bit arbitrary, then corporate behaviour changes to take account of those definitions. So if you say uh, a part-time worker gets rights if they work more than 16 hours a week, then suddenly you find out a whole lot of workers have put on 15 and a half hour a week contracts. You know? and, and the same applies to a whole lot of other dimensions. So however much you try and come up with a good definition, um, what you're basically doing is creating more and more work for clever lawyers to find, to find ways around it. And in, 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 and in the process, possibly shaping, um, shaping future employment patterns in an inappropriate way, or kind of freezing. We, you know, we're in the middle of a very dynamic change now. If you kind of take a snapshot of what it looks like now and say, oh, well, that's what a platform looks like now. Let's legislate for them then you're kind of freezing this moment of time forevermore into the legislation as a kind of permanent idea of what a platform is, so I th which I, I, think, um, I think that's dangerous. So what it's, it seems to me is we need, we need universal coverage. We need rules that apply to all workers, but very much in the principle of the welfare states that were set up in the second half of the 20th century in most European countries just as sets of universal rights. Universal rights, universal obligations, universal rules that apply to everybody. And you know, if, there's an except, if you want to make an exception, then it should be the employer's responsibility to make the case that this is an exception, not the worker's responsibility to embark on an expensive court case to try to, um, uh, try to get the rights that they should have had in the first place. Um, um, so we need a, a clarification of the definition of self-employment. I think this is, goes without saying. At the moment, it's a very, very messy co a concept in most European countries. There isn't a single test for self-employment. 
the courts will look at is there a relationship of dependency or not? Do they provide their own tools or not? Do they have the right to subcontract the work to somebody else or not? How regular is the work? Um, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are a whole lot of very messy tests for uh, what is, what is self-employment. It varies from country to country. Um, and in some, it's also a lot of inconsistency between how self-employment is treated in the tax system, in the social security system, and in the employment system. And a DG, DG Employment and Social Affairs are, are actively working on this in Brussels right now, including looking, uh, they've got a very ambitious program looking at the, the, the social protection rights of self-employed workers. So I think things are moving in a good direction here, but, um, but um, th there's an awful lot of work to be done. And um, the, it, in, both in the United States and in the UK, and in some other countries, there have been attempts to say, well, let's create a new category of employment that's somewhere between being an independent contractor and a subordinate employee. And it seems to me that that's very messy and very fraught with danger. I, I'm old enough to remember when teleworking first came on the scene in the early 80s, and at vast expense to the European taxpayer, loads of conferences with labor lawyers from every European member state and um, uh, health and safety experts for every European mem member state all came together in a series of, con of, of conferences to try to define what a teleworker was in law. And then a very learned uh, professor at the University of Leuven in Belgium said, well, what we need is a new category of worker called a teleworker. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, I, I, that it, it seems to me it's not a useful way forward. Anyway, uh, but we also, along with that, along with a, a clarity about the definition of what self-employment is, because there are genuine freelancers who are genuinely freelance, who should, be, you know, we should be clear about who they are and what their rights are and what, uh, you know, what freedoms they have to charge, what they want to charge for their services, etc. We also need, need a clarification of the definition of subordinate employment. Uh, you know, that should be in the Labour Code or wherever. Um, and, but uh, once you've decided who a subordinate worker is, then um, they need to have some new rights specified that nobody thought of 50 years ago, but are now important. Uh, they need, obviously, health and safety rights, including the right to call in inspectors clarification about who's responsible for insuring them, for legal liability, including professional liability, rights to data protection, um, rights to communications with employers or platforms, including rights to challenge arbitrary suspensions and customer ratings. And as I'm saying, this, is, this should apply not just to platform workers, this should apply to all workers, the right to challenge um, customer ratings, for instance, or arbitrary suspensions. These should be universal worker rights, it seems to me. And the, uh, any other national statutory rights should apply. We also need a clarification of the definition. We already have quite strict regulation in Europe of private employment agencies and of temporary work agencies. And it seems to me that an awful lot of the platforms that are around actually should fall into one or other of these categories. Either they're a platform which is giving people temporary work, or they're a platform which is um, putting them in touch with an employer, or, um, or they're, they're, they're a temporary employer. And apart from anything else, it's not fair on the other temporary work agencies and employment agencies who are tightly regulated to have these new companies moving in on their terrain who are not regulated at all. So the level playing field, if you like, among temporary work agencies and employment agencies is being disrupted. So that needs to be clarified. And of course, we also need, uh, because of the physical fragmentation of this workforce, uh, there is a real need for much greater investment in inspection and compliance with clear reporting procedures uh, up for breaches and, and penalties for failure to apply. Because you can have the most perfect regulation in the world, but if there's nobody there to enforce it, enforce it, it won't happen. 
And if there's nobody, nowhere for workers to go to complain that the, the, the employer is in breach, then it's not going to happen. So these seem to me really... Um, and finally, uh, I'm not going to grasp the mettle of the UBI, um, uh, which I've written about extensively. Um, <laughs> but uh, there is clearly a need for social security and tax systems to be adjusted to fit the reality that uh, an increasing proportion of the population is fluidly moving in and out of employment in, in ways that the existing categories don't deal with. And this is the, um, the report where of the, the results of our research from the first seven countries. The data, for anybody who likes playing with data, the data is now all up online as well for people to, uh, it's, it's quite a complicated data set because, you know, we're not saying this is a crowd worker, this isn't, a, though we've got, um, it's a constructed variable, you might say. But, um, but anyway, we're hoping to extend this, as I said earlier, to another eight countries. So, so watch this space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I know that we are running a little late, but um, I'm sure nobody wants to, uh, uh, wants to miss this opportunity to ask Sorry, questions sure. about Ursula. That's, that's perfectly fine. Thank you very much. I think we will take one or two questions uh, quickly, and then we can move to, uh, to the coffee, coffee break. Hello, I'm Henry Sierra from Helsinki University, a student, also uh, very, very involved in this matter because I'm working for one of these companies here in Helsinki who provide, uh, well, gig labor basically. So I just want to say a thank you for voicing uh, the, the things you said here, especially with your qualitative findings. It strikes very much close to home. Um, so thank you. Uh, do you... Uh, do you see these uh, regulatory uh, things progressing on what kind of timeline do you do you feel the European level is moving with this matter? Uh, well, I think, first of all, it's moving very, very differently in different national contexts. In uh, Sweden and in Denmark, trade unions are, are successfully negotiating collective agreements with platforms. In, in Sweden, with online platforms with quite skilled workers. In, in Denmark, with uh, lower skilled local platform workers. And of course, uh, well, I don't need to tell you the Nordic countries have a very strong tradition of, of collective bargaining. In uh, the UK, the actions that are being taken uh, uh, take the form of challenging employment status in court, basically. There's been a whole string of court cases, some taken by the official trade unions, like the GMB, I mean traditional trade unions, some taken by the new uh, trade unions that, that are growing up, and some taken by individuals to try to establish um, what the employment status of, of, of workers is with platforms. Now, the, the, the results of these cases have been somewhat contradictory, not surprisingly, because there's such a diversity of, of business models among the platforms. And one case, which was the Pimlico Plumbers, was actually quite a traditional plumbing company that used a business model that was very like a platform. But, or, but it's been going for like about 20 years. And the case against Pimlico Plumbers has set precedents. You know, we have a common law tradition. So it's kind of quite messy landscape in the UK. And other common law countries like the United States and Australia have got a similar pattern. In Germany, uh, a very interesting initiative by IG Metall has brought um, initially eight and now more of the biggest online platforms brought them together in a dialogue with the union, and they've come up with a voluntary code of good practice. There's also a website called faircrowdwork.com, I think it is. So, uh, so the German model is different again. So there are these very different national models. Um, in uh, the European level, there, um, 
There is a move to get a directive for platform workers along the lines of the temporary work agency uh, model. There have also been um, adjustments to other ongoing directives, like the directive on written statements, for instance. The people, the trade unions have, have ne uh, negotiated to add some clause, clauses to that to negotiate for... Um, to include platform workers in the written, written statements directive. Um, the, there's a kind of quite a deeper problem which is being addressed again partly through the courts, which is the, the very difficult question of competition law and the fact that uh, in, in principle, if you're self-employed, you can't uh, get together with other self-employed people and negotiate over payment because that means you're a cartel which is illegal under European competition law. And so that means it's very difficult to organize self-employed workers into trade unions, although in some countries they do, in the UK and in Denmark, for instance, uh, self-employed people are very well represented in trade unions. In Germany, they're, they're a bit more cautious, so they, they, so they say you can only negotiate about other things, but not about pay. So, 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 and there have been some test cases brought by some musicians in the Netherlands, which had a bad result. <laughs> which, which said that no, the musicians were not, uh, although they were employed by the orchestra, they were self-employed, so therefore they couldn't negotiate together over wage. So it's, it's very, very messy. So there are a lot of legal problems there. Um, and I, as I said, there are also initiatives um, to try and uh, to at least develop good practice models uh, for the treatment of self-employed people in um in uh, social protection systems. The DG Employment and Social Affairs, according to their own research that they've recently commissioned, by 2045, I think it is, they estimate that more than half of the European working population will be in atypical forms of employment. So in the past, people have always said, oh yeah, there's atypical employment, but the majority of work is still typical. And don't get it all out of proportion. But where the, on, on current trends, we're moving to a situation where normal work might actually be only for the minority uh, in, you know, in the foreseeable future. So.